Hello there, Faithful Politics listeners. If you're joining us on our podcast stream or watchers, if you're joining us via YouTube or viewers, watchers, watchers sounds creepy. I, uh, I don't want to be a watcher. I want to be a viewer. I don't know if that sounds hey. better or not. But anyway, uh, this is Josh Bertram. I'm your faithful host and we have Will Wright with us. It's good to see you, Will. Yeah, it's good to be seen and heard. Yes, and Will is our political host, and today we have the distinct pleasure to have Ed Uzinski. He has his PhD from Bowling Green State University. He's been a content specialist for Crew, Athletes in Action, and Family Life for over three decades. He also serves as a oneness and diversity consultant for church and parachurch organizations. He's written for a range of online platforms such as Desiring God, Mockingbird, and The Washington Times. He's a frequent speaker and podcaster on the topics of race, sports, culture, and marriage. He lives with his wife, Amy, and their four children just outside of Dayton, Ohio. We were just talking about this before the uh, recording started. That That's where I was at for a while, and uh, so it's a cool connection there. Ed, it's great to have you on the program with us today. It's very good to be here. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, it might be a conflict of interest to say something positive to my hosts today before we actually get into the podcast. <laughs> but I did want to say this. I was thinking about it this morning. When I started my PhD, the guy that chaired my dissertation was a outspoken progressive. And he knew that I was an evangelical Christian. And one of the things that we wound up spending a lot of time talking about is just our both of our lament at the lack of civil discourse in the cultural moment yes. that we find ourselves in. And, and we um, committed ourselves in spite of radically different worldviews to meeting regularly, asking each other questions, talking them out. It was, it was a beautiful thing as it usually is when you can do that in good faith with each other. And so I grew to appreciate one, just how difficult it is now to pull that sort of thing off but two to acknowledge when guys are at least trying to do it and so i i say that to you guys yes um i just appreciate the um i appreciate the effort to try to slow down thank you look at things from different directions and, and i remember i used to say to him too i wanted to say hey look and in, in, what do you expect in secular society there's not going to be civil discourse but what we ended up talking about is why there wasn't more civil discourse within the church which really bothered me and convicted me that he was able to take that position. And I had very little to be able to say back to him that that has not been You're like, wait, no, wait. Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. Right. There's no civil difference. So I just said, man, <laughs> as much as it depends on me, I want to keep moving into spaces where I can bring about civil discourse about things that matter, you know, have difficult conversations yes. about things that matter and come out the other side, still being human, still able to extend love and understanding. So thank you for trying, fellas. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you for writing the book that we're going to talk to you about today, Untangling Critical Race Theory, What Christians Need to Know and Why It Matters. And, you know, we've had several people on the program to talk about critical race theory. Yeah. And, you know, we always feel like the the middle, the person in the middle is the one who gets shot. Um, and we're trying to figure out you know, what's, uh, what's what in all of this. And we've had people on to talk about this issue, people um, that were very much against it, people that were very much for it. And, uh, and, and we get it, we wound up getting criticism, no matter who you have on, because yep. they don't like having voices that, that you disagree with. But hence I my, guess to go with our, hence my opening point. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I guess to go with, and I say this tongue in cheek, just for anyone who's first listening, our, our favorite president, Donald Trump, what he, what his, his, uh, his mind and his, uh, way of living is, uh, it's good press or bad press, but as long as they're talking about me, it's okay. And that's kind of, we want people to be talking about us and talking about this. Right. I on. say that tongue in cheek. So right Ed, thanks again for being on here. And uh, what brought you to write this book uh, about um, critical race theory? That's a great question. Um, it's a, there's a long answer. I'll give you the short one. 
So my upbringing was in the on the west side of Cleveland in a very ethnically diverse setting. Lots of white, black, Puerto Rican, um, and and all different other ethnicities. But those were the three main ones. So I grew up in very much a melting pot where I found myself regularly playing the role of translator. So obviously I'm a white person, white skinned person. But I was living in all three of those different communities for different reasons. Um, and so I was trying to learn how to help each of them understand each other. And what I found often I would be in one community and they would have these perceptions of the other communities that just wasn't true. That's just like not what I experienced when I was hanging out with those guys on the other side. So I was regularly playing that role of let's just call it a cultural translator. Um, without, I didn't know that's what I was doing, but I was. Then I became a Christian when I was in college and um, started to work with a conservative evangelical organization in Athletes in Action and crew. And really, the whole stream that I found myself caught up in was what we would, I suppose, consider white evangelicalism of a certain stripe in the late 1980s. Um, more religious right influenced, dispensationalist influenced. Again, there's a lot of different labels that would go with that. Um, <clears throat> But I was, I was brought up amongst that kind of Christianity. But then I went and did a very um, radical, secular PhD. I actually did two theological degrees at Trinity. So I did a conservative theological degrees. But then I went and did a very radical thing by basically studying Marxism and critical theory and critical race theory back in the early 2000s. Didn't even realize how relevant that was going to become. In fact, when I graduated with it, I just thought, well, that was good for me. I don't know how that's going to show up anywhere. And then, of course, in the last decade, those have been buzzwords that have needed attention, at least in our circles, you know, from church people. So <clears throat> the confluence of those three things intersecting with each other are sort of what formed the background. And I... I'll just say one other thing. I was thinking about this. I had um, a very good friend. Her name was Elizabeth Kaprosky. She's one of, you know, in our adult life, she's in that circle of best friends, you know, and she was um, committed to uh, serving immigrants in the Dayton area, committed to cross-cultural competency, not from that kind of background really at all, but was pushing herself to step across that line. And when we would meet together, she kept challenging me to say, you of all people should be entering into this at a more intellectual level um, and not just talking about it amongst us as friends. When are you going to write something and stop just talking about it? And Elizabeth ended up dying a few years ago um, of cancer. And one of the things that I just felt extremely, again, convicted about, compelled about, and I even told her before she died, I'm going to step in. I'm going to step into the bull ring, if you will, and and put this out there in book form in some kind of way. So that was still probably a longer answer than what I intended to give, but that's that's a lot of the background as to how I got here. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, th yeah. Thanks for 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 sharing that, Ed. And you know, but I I guess maybe maybe the 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 more fundamental question is like why why should Christians care about critical race theory. I mean, you know, critical race theory near as I, as I understand it is sort of this legal framework, you know, sort of this inherent systemic racism that that exists and permeates kind of through our legal system. So like why why should Christians care about it? Yeah, goodwill. Um and maybe I'll have to answer this question first. Why should Christians care about race at all? And my answer to that would be that it it's a and I've been saying this for years, it's a demonic stronghold. It's, it's one of those places that Satan has, has hung out and done tremendous damage to the Imago Dei, right? To the image of God in, in, in humans around the globe across history. And we have our own particular version of how that, how that um, treachery has played itself out in our nation across centuries. And so Christians should have a concern to bring the gospel to bear wherever it is that Satan is, is hanging out. So I would say that in general, when it comes to critical race theory, then critical race theory is asking us to take seriously the role that our racialization as Americans continues to play in the lives of people. I know there's a lot in there. And again, I listen to a lot of the podcasts that you guys have already done, and I feel like 
really, do we even need one more about it? I feel like you could put some of those just on a <laughs> loop. Anytime you want to talk about Rays, just play, you know, the R Romero and, and, and Leo uh, one or, you know, any of the others because you guys have done such a good job of picking this apart. Critical race theory at its best helps us to ask questions that we need to keep asking and interacting with, especially as white Christians. Um, so that we can yeah. continue to restore and heal and move towards one another in a spirit of unity, which is ironic because, again, so much of the rhetoric around it is that it, it's disunifying, um, which we can dig into that if we want. But it really should be unifying the types of questions that it gets us to ask ourselves. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it, it's it's funny because. You know, just thinking about <clears throat> your comment, like we've already, you know, talked to people about it and, and the thought came to my mind, you know, everyone wants to be first to market, you know, when they, they write a book or they do, you know, they want to be the first one who's bringing something out there so they can be the, you know, the end of the spear kind of thing, or the head of the spear and, and, and going into new territory. But I think the reality is, the very essence of this talk about race and critical race theory is that it's not just this thing that we talk about and then move on from. Right. You know, oh yeah. Well, we talked about that. That was, you know, that was sexy for that time and that was cool. Now let's move on. We we've talked about this because that's the exact thing that has happened before in the past is yeah. we've talked about it. It's solved. Let's move on. Well, but nothing yeah has changed. Right. So Good. yeah, I want to, I, I, I want to give you a chance to speak on that. And even are there stories that you could share with our audience that have shaped you in your feelings of race to bring you to where you are now in the way in which you've written this book? Yeah. Good, Josh. And, 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 you know, let me even maybe go back to answering the question of why I wrote it is because my experience, and I know this looks different all across the country, people have different experiences. My experience around white evangelicals, people that would carry that label of evangelical with them, is that we don't do a very good job of thinking about race or talking about race. Uh, a lot of my white friends will say, I'm tired of hearing about race, but hearing about race is different than talking about race. And, and even to say we talked about race, to your point, Josh, doesn't mean we've actually done anything different. It may mean we just had a small group study where it came up, or again, there was a, a social quake that caused our pastor to say something from the pulpit about it. And then it just kind of fades yeah. into the background again, right? And so it's really left us at a deficit, really, to even be a part of these conversations. I just don't think that most of us, and again, I don't say this in a condemning way necessarily, it's just, it's just our reality that most white folks in the church, especially ones that have not grown up in a multi, um, in a diverse environment, racially diverse environment, don't have education, very much education about how to interact cross-culturally. We're not forced yeah. to, you know what I mean? Especially if you're part of dominant culture, you're not forced to have to learn about anybody else. You can literally go through life ethnically indifferent. And so it leaves us at a disadvantage in this conversation. That's not been true for my black brothers and sisters who have, in a sense, been forced to learn how to accommodate themselves. If they want to be part of evangelicalism, they've had to accommodate themselves to dominant white dominant cultures. And they've had mm. to learn to be cross-culturally competent. And that's part of the reason why I wrote the book is just to, to try to help white people slow down not get thrown off by all the rhetoric about critical race theory, but let's actually use this moment to dig back into questions and problems that have been getting talked about for decades in some circles. Let's keep having those conversations. Uh, it's you you're asking me things that have happened. One of the things that happened is that I bumped into the writings of Carl Henry. And I wonder if, if you listeners mm. know who Carl Henry is. He's a great guy to go Wikipedia and go look up. He, he in the mid last century was one of the largest names in evangelicalism as we know it today. He really would be considered a father of the evangelicalism that most of us are, are brought up in. 
help found Christianity Today, help found Fuller Seminary, the Evangelical Theological Society. Like he had his hands in all of that stuff. And in 1947, he wrote a book called The Uneasy Conscious of Fundamentalism. And fundamentalism just meant evangelicalism at the time. And what he was writing about, he said he had a great concern that in response to the social gospel of the early 1900s, where there was there, the pendulum had swung where we were no longer talking about sin and savior, but we were trying to help people meet people's physical needs in the city, let's say, or we were trying to meet their, their physical realities, but left out sin and savior. The backlash against that now had caused there to be such an emphasis on the redemptive side of the gospel that now we were no longer paying attention to the people's physical needs and the social justice side of things. It's like the pendulum just keeps swinging. And Carl Henry said, that's never been the way Christians have operated. The redemptive side of the message uh, and the sin and the savior side of the message has always been wed to a way of living that confronts injustices in society. That's just the way, that's the way of the cross in society. And he said, because of this great divorce that we've allowed to happen, we're going to have a major problem on our hands as evangelicals. When young people are left with no other option but to turn to secular ideology, to get this, this is in 1947, they're going to have to turn to secular ideology to meet the isms of the day, the racisms, the communism, the... the um, uh, not taking care of the poor and paying attention to vulnerable populations, just everything that goes along with that, they're going to turn away from Christianity and find their answers elsewhere. And so here we are 70 years later, um, and I came across that maybe 15, 20 years ago when I, when I first started to interact with his stuff. I'm like, wow, there was an evangelical that, that noticed this back then. 70 years later, we're living amongst the consequences of that separation so that now anytime we hear, and again, when I say we, I mean the evangelicals that are part of the background that I've been a part of, when we hear words like justice, or we hear anything about poverty or class differentiation or anything like that, we immediately think Marxism, or we immediately think yeah. something that we heard maybe on Fox News, but we don't think Bible. <laughs> we, we think a TV commentary, we don't think the prophets, and that's a problem. Yes. You know, I, I was, I was, I was thinking that I, I love that a white evangelical, um, smart person, um, wrote, uh, a book about CRT, especially kind of as it applies to the Christian church, because I think that, that you, your voice, your message, I think you have access to a demographic of America that, um, like somebody that looks like me probably wouldn't. Um, um, so I'm, I, I'd love for you to, to maybe let us know how your, how your message, how your book has been received, um, by, you know, the, the larger, broader Christian population. Um, I mean, on one side, it's like, I like to believe that people kind of welcomed it with open arms. They're like, Hey, this is great. This is just what we need. But I, I get the sense that that probably hasn't been your experience. Well, yeah, what makes what gives you that sense? The fact that <laughs> nobody can talk about this with, without people taking immediately taking sides and kind of run into their tribe. Yeah, I mean, the book's not even out yet as as we're talking right now. We're still a couple of weeks away from it actually launching. And man, I've experienced the extremes. I've experienced people that through tears have thanked me, literally, both white and black folks. And again, what is this book? It's not even I don't think that I'm saying anything radically new. It's just it's slowing down. It's pulling away from the hysteria. And, and it's 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 taking a biblical look at the questions and concerns that have been talked about. And again, maybe we should even be specific about what we mean by that. But some people have absolutely loved that. And some people have reacted hostily to it. On other podcasts that I've been on and the commentary, um, they're doing exactly what what I would expect. It's funny. I had one black friend five years ago when I first told him that I was actually going to try to write this book. And he just said, man, why would you do that at this stage of life? Black evangelical friend. Why, why would you even mess with that? Like, 
white people in particular are not going to want to hear what it is that I think you'll write and you're just going to mess your life up. I was like, thanks. Thanks for the encouragement, right? <laughs> thanks, brother. Appreciate that. <laughs> thanks, man. Because he's somebody I really respect, but I already knew that. Um, and again, I, I'm doing it as much as a result of a stewardship and just because it's driving me crazy not writing it. I even said that to myself. I needed to get this out of my head and my heart almost as an act of obedience. And I'm just going to have to take whatever comes with it. You know, I put it out there with some measure of fear and trembling, to be honest with you, because I've written articles on race before and it's not gone well. Which is part of the reason why we need to do more of it, you guys. Again, that that's, you know, it takes a certain measure of courage. Um, and I'm honestly, I'm not sure what my level of courage is right now with this, but it does take a certain measure of courage to say, I'm going to step into this area that's where Satan dwells and try to represent the gospel in a way that, why, why would we even do this? Um, in, in a way that will allow people to see that Jesus actually is the answer to all this and that there is a more sane way to move through it that actually brings people closer together than what we typically do. People lose their mind when it comes to race. That, that's why I can say so confidently that it really is this like strange demonic stronghold. The reaction when you try to talk about race is there's almost nothing that you can bring up that causes people to react more violently and viscerally than any conversation about race. So uh, it was it was time for yeah. me to play, you know play my role and throw this out there and, and take whatever comes. Well, I mean, I just uh, appreciate your courage and your willingness to walk in obedience to what God is asking you to do. Because I agree, when it's something that becomes such an issue that we can't even talk about it. And we don't even ask ourselves why we can't talk about it. Yeah. That part is really, yeah, that part is really concerning that we're not, we're not bringing this stuff up, that we're not talking about it when it was something that was so clearly such a deep part of God's plan was that he would bring racial recon reconciliation. When you understand the Bible in its context, it's just all over the place. Yes. I was thinking about even the book of Ruth I read yesterday, and it mentions time and time again that, that Ruth was a Moabite. Mm. And the Moabites were a hated group in the Jewish context because of different things that had happened in the past. And it continues to say that Ruth was a Moabite, and she ends up being the great grandmother of David, or, or it's either great grandmother or great, great grandmother. And so it's like this famous king, right? Like the king, right? The epitome of the king uh, follows God. And they have a Moabite in their genealogy. And mm. just again, reminded how much this is part of God's plan. This is reconciliation between ethnic in racial lines, because that was an ethnic line. Yes. <laughs> that was absolutely an ethnic line. We don't think of it in those terms today, so it doesn't offend us when we see that Ruth was a Moabite. But to an Israelite, it would be offensive. Yes. Or could certainly be offensive. And so it makes me think about the ways in which theology and scripture interact with critical race theory. So when you think of something like CRT, you got, if you just start out with CRT, it might automatically turn some people off to hearing it because of that acronym or yeah. the name or the word race or whatever. And it's as difficult as that is, as much as we wish that wasn't the case, I think it is a reality that we have to accept at some level. It is. So the question though. Sorry. Oh yeah. Sorry. The, my, my question, and you can speak to that. Okay. Uh, anything I've just said, but my question is, how does this intersect with Christian theology, the okay. tenets of critical race theory and Christian theology? Because I think if people hear, if they come at it and understand here, here's what the Bible is saying, and here's how we can show you the Bible is saying this. Yeah. 
And then here's what critical race theory is saying. And here's where this overlap, here's a contrast. Here's where they connect and overlap. Yeah. What are those areas where people can see it and start to let maybe the hardness of their heart be chipped away at to be able to talk about these things? Yeah, that's a great question. So let me just throw this out there first. You're right. CRT is just like the latest lightning rod. Okay, but I, what I was thinking, even as you were speaking, is what what are we really talking about when we're talking critical race theory? It, it's a it's a confrontation. Critical race theory is a confrontation with a particular narrative that says we're all good now when it comes to race. We're good. Race is not really a it's it's not really even a viable like you shouldn't mess around looking through the race lens at things. All that does is cause problems. We're all on equal ground. Let's be colorblind. Um, Everybody just kind of pull their own weight. If you take responsibility for your life, you'll be able to get ahead, right? Like that's that was the narrative in the early 70s, post-civil rights, especially post-civil rights legislation, where everybody was like, let's just move on now. We're good. Can we finally stop with this? Which is not new. In particular, amongst white folks, again, if you look at history going all the way back to the Civil War and pre-Civil War, there has always been a contingency of people that will step up and say, this isn't that big of a problem. They will always find a way to not talk about it. Okay, so even when the original critical race theorists started theorizing about why there was still discrimination, why there were still unequal outcomes, why there was still the problems in the schools and in the criminal justice system and in housing and in education, right? Everything that all these different social lanes, when they started theorizing about why is it that things are still broke, the backlash against that wasn't anything new. There's always a, a what Devin Carbato calls a retrenchment. There's always any time there's any kind of progress or somebody starts to dig into why things are the way they are, there will always be a backlash against that. So I say all that to say even the things that are being talked about when it comes to critical race theory today, those things have always gotten talked about. What are the patterns and policies and procedures that are in place that maintain a racial hierarchy where one group has advantage against another group? That's been get, that stuff's been getting talked about for hundreds of years. The question for us in the church is, like we said at the beginning, one, do we even allow that to be a category of thought? And for too many of us, there, again, there's just this immediate pushback that we can't even talk about that. We can't talk with that language, that there's a separation between haves and have nots, or that there's a hierarchy where there's one group that's at the top and everybody else is underneath. That, that just gets shut down, which I think is just historically ridiculous that we can't even allow ourselves to have that conversation when, when for hundreds of years, everybody knew what it meant to be white. I would just say that it's like all of a sudden in 1965, we were no longer allowed to think about what it meant to be white when for literally hundreds of years, it was in the laws. It was on the on the front door, whites only. And you knew what it meant. OK, but now we can't talk in those categories. Um, everybody knew that there were laws being put in place to purposely make sure that certain things happened and certain things didn't happen. But now to talk about patterns or policies or procedures is like, that, again, whatever, that's Marxism, it's, it's wokeness, we haven't used that word yet. It's radical progressivism, which a lot of times it is, right? But we just label it in some kind of way that allows us to not have to talk about it. And that's that's the problem in the church. And I really, again, what am I even after when, when it comes to this? I want Christian organizations, Christian fellowships, Christian denominations to take a deep breath. Is this going to look different all over the country? It looks different in every denomination now. It looks different in parachurch organizations and in local fellowships, whether you're in a city or the country. East Coast, West Coast, right? Texas, I just came from Texas compared to being up in the Northeast. It's going to look different, but it is worth asking the question, what are our patterns? What are our policies maybe that are in place? What are our procedures that we've just come to accept as normal that might leave some people feeling like they're on the outside of our fellowship? 
even if they're physically present in it, psychologically, they feel like they're not really included in this. There really is kind of a dominant normal, again, I'll just call it white people's dominant normal that everyone else has to adjust to and that always leaves people feeling a little bit outside of it. Let's just ask the question. And because when you do that, and that's been my experience, when you do that amongst people that are open to that conversation, really redemptive things happen. Really interesting things happen when you start to, when I, when I start to embrace other cultures, when I, when I try to be comp, cross-culturally competent, I, and I start to view the world through other cultures' eyes and other ethnicities' eyes, it actually does something really good for me as a human being and as a Christian and as a member of a global body of Christ, right? It does something good for me that kind of like uh, takes me deeper into what it means to be the body of Christ. That's what CRT means, <laughs> means to me, that we would start to ask those kinds of questions and not stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, but like, how do you, how do you get people motivated to, to, to even care to kind of have this like consciousness for issues of justice. Um, I mean, you know, the, the, the church today in America is undergoing some pretty radical magnification. <laughs> um, and, and it's just like that, the, there are like a number of issues going on in the church right now across the country. Like, how do you get them to kind of zero in that, Hey, this is kind of an issue that, that, might actually be at the heart or the root of a lot of the problems the church, you know, is, is seeing today. Good, Will. And I'll go back. I realized I didn't really answer the back end of Josh's question, which is mm -hmm. where in the Bible? I mean, what I would do is appeal to the Bible. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be a critical race theorist apologist. I'm not trying to get people to become critical race theorists. I'm trying to use critical race theory to help us see something we already should see, but don't. Um, and people say, well, why do we need critical race theory if we've got our Bibles? I'd say that's a really, really good question. Why don't we see <laughs> things, right? And so, you know, if God will use a donkey sometimes to get the attention of his prophet, he might want to use, sec he might have to use secular ideology to get the attention of his people in some cases. If they're for whatever reason are blind to this, the fact that from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Re Revelation, one of the huge themes that just comes up over and over and over again is God disciplining his people for not watching out for vulnerable populations in their midst. Injustice shows up in the fact that people with power are allowed to take advantage of the poor. They're allowed to take advantage, again, of the widows and the orphans that get named in, in the New Testament with the take advantage of the, of the foreigner, yeah, the foreigner, the immigrant, right? The person that's vulnerable because they're not in their secure place or they, they don't have anybody to step up for them. There, there's there's nobody to stand up. And um, Solomon talks about it in Ecclesiastes, that the oppressed get away with what they get away with because there's no one to stand up for them. Uh or the oppressor gets away with what they get away with because there's no one to stand up for the, the oppressed. So that language is all over the place. When, when Again, when you start to even just pay attention for it. And so the question is, why don't we know that? Why, why have I spent, why do I have two theological degrees at a, from a leading evangelical institution? And I think there was one, there were, there were a couple classes where it was very intentionally, because it was part of my, my sub-discipline, that we looked at what justice looked like in the city. Because my, my, I, the, my, I got a Master's of Divinity, which was just a basic pastoral degree, right? But then I also did a Master's in Christian Thought um, that was in contemporary culture, okay? And thinking about issues of contemporary culture. So inside of there... I had a class or two where we would talk about justice in the city, but all the rest of the curriculum, it never came up in all my Bible studies and everything else. How is that possible when that's such a huge theme? Again, I think it's a fascinating question. Like what, how does, how did curriculums get shaped coming out of the racist history that we've all 
that we all stand on the shoulders of at the very least. It's just interesting what themes have been left out of our discipleship, significant themes. And I don't need to go back and try to blame everybody or, you know, that that's not the point either. The point is, how do I fill this gap in my own discipleship and in the people I have, I have responsibility for or I have influence over to see that, man, why is justice, I, um, I want to say ideas of justice, but that's not the right word. Why are our antenna not up for issues of justice? That's what I want to say. Why are we not paying attention to that in our midst, whether it's on a college campus or it's on a sports team, you know, in my ministry with athletes in action, or you work in a city, like wherever you find yourself at socially, are your antenna up for people that are being taken advantage of? I talk to my kids about it as they go to junior high. Watch out for people that are being mistreated today and make sure you're not being a part of that, right? That's where it starts. I, I absolutely love that. <clears throat> I mean, I I love that, Ed. And I think that you're on to something. And one, one of, you know, the skills that you're supposed to learn in, in your education is how to read. And I just, I, I, I wanted just to make this, one point and then ask a practical question here because I'm a, I'm a pastor and just ask some next steps for for pastors but you know the title the one thing one thing you're supposed to do I read this book called How to Read a Book Mortimer Adler great yeah. great book yeah. it's awesome um I know it sounds dorky but it's worth the read but the, basically the title right first thing look at the title try to understand the title and the title of your book is Untangling Critical race theory and to untangle means to free something complicated or make something rather complicated or confusing, easier to understand or deal with. Yeah. And so whatever it is, right? So when people see that, they'll see, you know, they can see all oh, critical race. Theory. Oh, I don't know. I can't untangle, understand it. There's a lot going on that we feel like is confusing. And if we're confused, great. We're, we're in good company. There's a lot of people that are confused good because they hear a lot of sound bites from different places. So the question is, we have this untangling, how does a pastor and address anything I just said, but how does a pastor like myself untangle this mm -hmm. and then help others under our shepherding, our spheres of influence, untangle this, this, this issue? Yeah, good, Josh. Well, when it comes to CRT in particular, and this is what I'm trying to do, at least in the beginning of the book, is, is let's slow down and let's look at each of the tenets, okay? And, and, and some of the concepts that are on the table when it comes to critical race theory. And let's look at how this can go really bad, depending on how it's used. And let's look at how this actually could be redemptive. So I do that with eight different tenets, eight of the main tenets. And Josh, I heard you say this on one of the podcasts that you guys already did. Theory is neutral. People are not. And I thought you probably don't remember if you saying that, but I, I thought that was really insightful. That sounds good, man. I got to preach that one. Yeah, we'll make a, <laughs> a t-shirt. You guys can make a t-shirt out of that. Um, Theories are just that. They're ideas about how the world works. They're suggestions. They're hypotheses. They're, they're looking at social reality and saying, here's my guess as to why it is that's operating the way it is. And then what people do in academia is they take that theory and they try to apply it in different situations and in different disciplines, right? And so it does. Yeah, it goes all yeah, over good. the place. So my contention in the book is that there's some really, really poor application of theory. There, there's, there's application that I would not go along with as a Christian, but the questions that it's getting us to ask, okay, are definitely worth exploring. And even some of the answers that our secular friends come up with are actually, you know, there's overlap with the Bible, but you won't know that until you slow down and actually talk. Let's just talk like one tenant at a time. So the idea that racism is normal, it's endemic, it's hardwired into the system, okay? And people right away go crazy about that and say, you're saying everybody's racist, everything is dripping with racism, everything, right? You go to this extreme where it's like, this surely this can't be true. And they give you all kinds of examples where racism 
didn't show up in this situation. I say, okay, I, if you're going to take it to the extreme of saying that it's dripping everywhere, yes, you're going to be able to find examples where it's not. I don't think, though, that that's what the original writers intended for us to think of it as. They're just saying you can't get away from the fact that we've been racialized in that you cannot not see race. It's just the way we've been wired in our history and in our nation. It doesn't mean you're a racist. We're not saying anything at all about that. We're just saying you can't get away from it. So it's, it's you know, we're arguing if that's the case then, what does that mean in our fellowship? How has race played a role in our history? Would be my next question. How has race played a role in our history, in our congregation? or in this organization? That's a fascinating question that always takes you to very interesting places. And that's what I do with every one of the tenants. Here's where it goes really bad, potentially really bad. Here's where it can actually be helpful and raise questions that could be useful to us. Josh, what I'd also do, again, I don't know that I wanna spend all my time thinking about critical race theory. I think it's interesting. I think it actually can be helpful but I think as pastors, we have more work to do in teaching people what we already talked about. What does the Bible say about justice? How does race yeah. show up all over the place in the Bible? What if we looked at the Good Samaritan story and we just looked at it through a racial lens? How might it change the way we think about the interaction and the dynamic? What, you know, when we're worried about generational sin, when we read the Kings and we see that there are there are judgments that are being meted out on people because of things that two kings ago did. Okay, and again, I, I could go all over the place with this. There's two kings ago were making choices that were against God's will that now this generation, two kings later, is paying the consequences for and is being held accountable for in different ways. Um <clears throat> That's why so many of our black brothers and sisters just shrug their shoulders at this accusation of CRT because they've been theorizing through a biblical lens this way literally for decades. They've been asking these questions. They've been reading the scriptures in this way because, because of their own experience and where they come from. And they look at white people and say, how do you not see this? How, how has this not been part of your discipleship to pay attention to justice, for example, or to care for marginalized people or these sorts of things? How are you not able to look at power? Why does the idea of studying power throw you off so much when the Bible is full of power plays and power dynamics and power gone wrong? Why is that such a foreign idea to you? Why do you think that's Marxism? Like, why are you giving Marx the credit for that? That's just the way we read our Bibles. Again, that's my black brothers and sisters have been telling me that literally for decades. So maybe we need to get more in tune with, with some different theological streams of thought. Maybe we need to read some more books from black theologians or, you know, the black experience yeah. and not right away be on the defensive or you're just going to read it to look for what's wrong with, with it. When Jamar Tisby or Eric Mason or, uh, you know, Tabidi or some of these other names, again, maybe people don't know all these names, but there's been really good stuff that's been written that's just, again, been dismissed and called Marxist or called woke. And that's, that in and of itself, can I say this, I think is demonic. I think that's aiding and abetting what Satan wants to do. Mm. When our initial reaction to people who have otherwise been orthodox in their thinking and in the way they've handled the scriptures, that we immediately write them off as woke or progressive or Marxist without even engaging their ideas. There's something really wrong mm. with that. So we could help people slow down and stop acting like the world. Yeah, that's yeah. So true. Real, yeah. real quick, Will. Mm -hmm. um, Ed, Will's going to have to jump off here, but we're going to mark this part. Okay. And we can continue our conversation for another 15 minutes or so. We typically aim for about an hour. And then we'll mark this and edit it out. But I wanted to just kind of let you know so that it wasn't like, oh, Will's gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what yeah. happened to Will? Did I offend him? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah no, uh, uh, um, great, great conversation, Ed. Uh, I'd love to have you back on the show just to kind of follow up and, okay. and just kind of chit chat. Um, but uh, but yeah, I appreciate everything that you're doing. Um, it, it really is um, just good, good work. 
could work. Thanks, man. And I will say this and again, maybe you just want to get it over with now. We can totally do this right now. I'm available the rest of the day. If you guys want to try to come back together and do another 15 minutes or half hour or whatever, I can make that work. Um, yeah. And, and unfortunately, my, my day is pretty, pretty booked that, up like my, my, my day job, you know, the, the, the job that pays for us to podcast um calls yes. <laughs> <laughs> so but uh, but but yeah uh josh will 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 we'll close we'll we'll finish up the the line of questioning questions that we have closes out and then we'll just go to edit edit this this part out but um th thanks again for everything Ed. i really appreciate it thanks will enjoyed talking to you yesterday and yeah if i can help in some other way let me know yeah we'll do all right thanks brother we'll see you okay see you and Josh, if you feel like I'm not answering something, because I know I'm I'm rambling a little bit as I'm getting into things here, just pull me back in or make sure we're answering the things that you want to get answered. Oh, you're good to go, man. Okay. You're good to go. I I, I love it. So let me Okay. I've marked it and let me um go ahead and ask the next question. Is that cool? Sure. All right. So You've done a lot of work on this, obviously this topic, and it's really important. And I think it's it's pretty awesome, you know, all the work that you are doing. And I think that it needs to be heard and talked about. And people need to stop demonizing each other over disagreements. Yeah, good like, word. This is just, it's wild. Yeah. The kind of stuff that's getting thrown out there, you know, how do we, how do we manage? And let me just get some context in this question. Okay. How do we manage the tension with where we want, we want the mission of Jesus to go forward, right? We want people to be evangelized. We want them to know Christ. We want him. We want them to hear the gospel. Right. And so I could see how someone would think all this stuff is distracting us from our mission yeah. to get the gospel out there. Right. I could see someone thinking that and I could have some empathy for them wondering we're getting tied up in these concerns of the world. Yeah. And we're not focusing on Christ. We're not being, quote unquote, colorblind. Right. We're just we're we're. Uh, you know, again, this is not what I'm thinking. I don't think that, but again, this is, I could see people thinking this and understand it. I have interacted with this kind of way of thinking because I could see someone being like, well, why are we spending so much time on this? It's so divisive. Why not spend time on things that are unifying and unify around the majors and forget about the minors and let's get on to the business of, you know, seeing the gospel move forward what is the mission of jesus like how does it connect with the issues that are being brought to light and surfaced in crt how do those issues in the mission of jesus kind of correspond and how do we navigate that tension with focusing on social justice issues and and maintaining the primary mission of of leading people to jesus yeah Again, a great question. And I've, well, I've really been swimming in those waters now for years within the ministry that I've been a part of in crew. I mean, that's been absolutely part of the tension in the last decade is that in several of our staff trainings, the, there were, there was an emphasis on paying attention to social issues, to justice. There was a, a, a lot more talk about what's going on politically and the damage that that's happening because of everything that happened after 2016. And it was really, um, it's, it's interesting, even in that environment, there were many, many people that were relieved that we were finally talking about how to bring the gospel to bear on those topics and issues that people are swimming in. And conversely, there was a lot of panic for precisely what you just said, Josh, that we're getting away. Wow, we've never done this before. We're getting away from what our initial charter was, which is just to preach the redemptive aspects of the gospel and help people grow in that. And so I, I totally appreciate 
that tension? We've already answered in, in, in some respect with the whole Carl Henry thing. And that is that they, they were never intended to be separated in the first place. Like our, 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 and the reason why we feel so much tension is because we're swimming in the waters of the separation, what he called the great divorce. We've let those ideas exist separately. The redemptive message or the mission is the redemptive message of Jesus. And everything else is secondary to a point that we don't really teach people about how to think about how to bring the gospel to bear on social realities. We, that's not part of our discipleship. So I want to go after that and just say, y'all, that's, that's a problem. We're, we're not trying to compromise the gospel. We're actually trying to live it out more fully and better in, in different spaces. And again, this will mean something different in the city then it might mean out here in the middle of Ohio, right? Where I'm out in maybe more of a country area. <laughs> the, but when you're in the city, issues of race and justice and the way, you know, the city gets mapped out, right? It's just so much more relevant when you're closer to urban areas. Um, and that's, again, that's not to say that it's not relevant all over the country. It's just more relevant there. So some people are going to feel a more intense loss if we're not thinking about how to bring the gospel to bear on social realities. And like I said, our black brothers and sisters have been have been patiently, and in some cases, not so patiently, which that bothers people too. When again, people finally say, we've used words long enough, let's start burning things down. Let's start screaming a little bit, right? Nobody likes that, that's not Christian. It's not, but it's what happens when there is a reticence or a stubbornness or an unwillingness to at least have the conversation on Maybe you've been, I don't want to say reading your Bible wrongly, but you're, you, you've been ignoring certain passages that should be informing the way we think about these social realities. You've been ignoring them or they're not, they've not been brought to the table for you. Or you're just part of a, even a, Josh, this is huge, a theological tradition that is teaching you from the ground up to not talk about social realities. So for example, I was just kind of doing a, a fresh deep dive into the whole dispensational approach to life, which, which says that because we're going to be raptured out of here before Christ's millennial reign, and again, this may be crazy talk to some of the listeners, but we shouldn't really mess around with anything in society. This society is going to hell in a handbasket. Right. There's no reason to try to bring reform or to pay attention to anything that's going on politically. Just help people come to Jesus and help them grow. Again, what, whatever that means, that's interesting because you'll, you're you going to encounter verses that in, the, in helping them grow that's going to cause them to think about social issues. They should. Maybe we'll avoid those and we'll just focus on certain passages that will just kind of keep people right here. And then there's other theological traditions, actually, that believe things about the end times that say we're actually supposed to be bringing reformation to this society through the gospel and that Jesus is not going to come back until more of that has happened. Same verses, looking at them very differently. And it affects then the way we think or conceptualize what our role and responsibility is in society. So even there, I'd just say, wow, that was a lot of words right there. And if you didn't understand what I just said, that, go and do a little study. Again, you could even just do this in a Wikipedia kind of a way, which I know is a cheap way in. But just go look at different eschatology. It's a great way. Right? Eschatology. Just go look that up on Wikipedia and look at all the different strands, theological strands from, from Orthodox people, people who have a high view of Scripture, who prioritize Jesus, who prioritize the need to, to submit ourselves to him, but they have a very, very different emphasis on passages and the way they think about those passages that cause them to have varying views on how involved we should be socially and what that involvement should look like. So obviously I'm representing a view that says because of my following of Jesus, I really should be more concerned about people who are vulnerable. I just even like saying it yeah. like that because even the word justice just keeps flipping people out. People who are vulnerable, people who are being taken advantage of, how do I use the power that I have, the resources that I have to watch out for them? 
And it's interesting because I'm in a sport ministry. I have been for a long, long, long time. And it's super easy for me to think, well, I work with athletes. Like, where does justice fit into that? And I'd say, well, that's a good question. I need to figure out where it fits into that. Maybe it's something that I'm doing with my money. Maybe it's something that I'm doing with my service time. And how I'm, again, as I'm, as I'm leading young men, as I'm discipling them, am I exposing them to life outside their own bubble? And to see how they can use and leverage what God has given them to bring relief to people. Pretty sure that's gospel work, man. I'm pretty sure that's what we're supposed to be about at some level because of Jesus' name. We could and should be doing more of that. And again, that's going to look different for everybody. But I can confidently say I think I should be doing more of that. Or at least I should continue to be conscientious of issues that are relevant to people that are vulnerable. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I appreciate you bringing that all out because it's important to be reminded that the way Jesus lived and the things that he did, right, regardless of what's going to happen, you know, in the future, Talk about eschatology, right? This eschaton, that Greek word for the end or the yeah, yeah. Fi- final phase of something and thinking about how God's going to wrap everything up here on the earth as we know it right now. Those are important matters to think about, but they're shrouded in such mystery. And it seems like there's really important matters to think about that Jesus came, spent 30 years on this earth, 33, I guess, whichever way you calculate it, 30 to 35, we'll just say that just to be safe, right? Years on this earth and spent a lot of time with people that were vulnerable, with people that were rejected by the society. And I think you have to ask yourself the questions of like, well, what's going on? there why does jesus care so much about the poor why does he care so much about people that society is rejecting why is he spending time with them why is he so living in in a way that's that's so contrary to the typical way that they were doing things yes at that time and 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 pushing boundaries pushing the envelope and it's very challenging if it weren't for jesus It might be easier in some ways. It's very challenging to figure it out because he's he's doing things. He's teaching in a certain way. His teachings are very, very intense. They're very, you know, they're definitely contextual, but they're they're very intense. They're in in the way that he lives. So it's like he's teaching as if he's a fundamentalist and he's living as if he's a progressive. Wow. In yep. some ways, in the way that we were thinking it, he's yep. the way he's hanging out with people, the way that he is connecting with people, the people he's allowing into his inner circle, the people that he's allowing to eat with him, which, of course, was that representative of full acceptance of that person when you ate with them and eating with prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners. I mean, it's very challenging when you start to look at how he was actually living his life. And it makes me think about like, man, if I, you know, that whole thing, WWJD. Yeah. That's a really good question. What would Jesus do Yeah, in these scenarios? It's, what would Jesus do with CRT? It's, and maybe that's the, maybe that's the best, you know, our, our last question just before it's just some practical questions as to how people can connect with you. But maybe the last big question is what is your hope about what, how this book brings us towards Jesus. What's your hope for it? And what do you, yeah, what what do you pray that it accomplishes? Yeah. In in the church and and broader. Yeah. Yeah. One, Josh, I just, I hope that it will make us more civil. We can end this thing the way we began it. I hope it will make us more civil towards one another in the church and outside the church. Okay. And when I say civil, I don't mean compromising. 
my faith or my belief to do it. So right away, again, I, I kind of get that sense that words like civil discourse are just being trampled. Empathy is being trampled these days because it's because there's such a need to have this us versus them. Everything is so binary. And I, I just think as Christians, we're actually supposed to transcend the binary. We're, we're supposed to be representing a different kingdom while trying to navigate this one. And it should look more like we're above it. Now, again, that doesn't mean we're not engaged in it. I'm just saying we should be able to look above and see what's not kingdom-like in this and see where there's kingdom overlap Whenever when it comes to anything. And that's not easy to do. That That's... That takes ongoing Bible study. It takes staying in communication with people that are helping us to think theologically about life, which again, we're just assuming that everybody's got access. Everyone's got access to it. We're assuming everyone's doing it. I've stopped assuming that people are actually reading their Bible and absorbing it the way they really need to, to be able to transcend what's happening in society. So my hope is that people will have a a renewed taste to go deeper into the Bible in ways maybe they haven't thought about before or haven't let themselves do. I hope that we'll become more um, sophisticated in the way we think about society. We didn't talk about this, but you know, there's such a breach in our spaces between individual personal sin and corporate systemic sin and problems. And again, we both know this, Josh, in our in our spaces, we're all about personal sin, but we don't know how to think about corporate or systemic sin. We write that off. Yeah, for sure. And again, the Bible is full. If you look for them, full of situations where you see how power is being used in corrupt ways to harm people. Okay. It becomes systematized in a way that people are harmed. And I hope I just hope we'll become because we slow down, we could become a little more sophisticated in the way we think about it. And I talk a lot about those things in, in this book, how to do that. But then at the end of the day, I really just also hope we'll learn how to be more human with people that are different from us and and really genuinely appreciate their story and their experience. Uh, And not assume that just because I know one black person or one Asian person's story that that ends up speaking for every black person or every Asian's story or experience. I need to keep moving towards people that are different from me and and seeing how variant, how many different variants there are of people's stories. But see that one of the themes is it's different from mine. And the way that the lenses that they're looking through is very different from mine. And so how do I appreciate that again as a member of the body of Christ? How do I appreciate that? How do I include that in my way of viewing the world and not just be so stubbornly and almost naively limited to just my own view? You know, when you interact with people that are different from you, it's amazing how it changes the way I'll say this for myself, how much it's impacted the way that I view the world and changed the way that I view the world. So I hope people will do more of that, Josh. I just, I I hope our spirit as we move forward in this discussion, and now we're about to head into this political season that you know is just going to be absolutely nuts. Yeah. I hope we'll just be a little bit more in touch with what it means to be a Christian moving through these spaces what it really looks like to represent a different kingdom in the midst of a very corrupt yeah. one that we find ourselves in right now. Yeah. I, uh, I definitely share that sentiment and I think it's really important that pastors have courage because our people are being discipled by not by Jesus they're being discipled by their, you know, whatever it is, radical left, radical right, yeah, whatever it is in the media, the ones that are going to say the things that they like, that they kind of already believe, and that they're going to be, that's who they're being discipled by. Yeah, and, and, and there's, it's, a fear. Uh, there's a fear, Josh, that comes with it. I don't mean to cut you out, but there's a fear. We haven't used no, that. No, I got yet. you. The reason why we need to have courage is because there's fear. There's fear we're going to lose donors. Yes. There's fear. I mean, that's real that we're going to lose money. And if you don't have money, you can't exist as an organization anymore. Right? Absolutely. So it just causes us to, instead of leading in these discussions, we end up kind of cowering and pulling back and just try to maintain 
um, equilibrium. We don't want to mess with it. Man, we had a good thing going. Why mess with that by talking about these controversial things? And I don't. I just don't want to go out like that, Josh. I want to go out having having tried to step into the stuff that I was responsible to step into. You know, I don't have to get into every single controversial thing going on in society. Yeah. But in this particular case, I'd feel a responsibility to step into the race conversation because of the the narrative that God has given me. And I would rather get to the end having tried, even if it ends up costing me. I guess I have to say that rather than take the more tepid approach and just kind of hide from it and wish I had done something more. So I hope more people will feel that way. There you yeah. go. We're asking, what do we hope? We hope, I hope more people will take the risk, even though it seems really um, unsafe right now to do that. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think that I, I like that. The hope is that people will take the risk to enter into some of these more uncomfortable spaces. So because of the potential reward of the unity, the forgiveness, the reconciliation, that the power of actual transformation that the gospel is supposed to bring and does bring. And that's why it won't go away. Yeah. It won't, it won't go away because the gospel is meant to transform. And if we have this area of deep sin in our lives, corporately and individually, where th there is no repentance, and there is no sense of trying to change, and I think God's not going to let us let it let let it go. I agree, um, Josh. And it's going to continue to come back. Yeah, just to even say this to be encouraging, and I really mean this. This is it's happening. It it is happening in in some yes. congregations. I just had a conversation with a, a happened to be a black man who is a pastor in Detroit. And he told me all about how for the last four years, after all the George Floyd stuff happened, his predominantly white church that was really thrown off by Black Lives Matter and, again, just kind of the usual stuff that was throwing people off, they slowed down and they began reading together different books. And they began having conversations about different scriptures. And they began to have um, exposure. They slowed down to do this together and they were patient with each other um, and there were some blow ups and there was some frustration but for the most part they stayed together as a congregation and now four years later there's testimonies among them not that they become radical progressives but that they see their brothers and sisters differently across the racial line than they had 10 years before okay because of the conversations they allowed themselves to have with orthodox bible believing people and I was so encouraged by that. I practically, I almost started crying just listening to him because I'm just like, I just need to keep hearing those stories mm. because I know they're happening. The hysteria, the social media world is not all that's going on in right now. So, so you be that kind of church, right? Grab this book or or uh, Romero and Leo. How, how do you say his name? Leo, Leo's book. I I'm, I forgot. Yeah, yeah but yes, but you, guys put, you, you put some different books in front of people. Get those books and Absolutely. read them together. You know, read them with a group of people and have discussion about them. How is this relevant to us? What does this look like in our fellowship? What's your experience been in your own life with this? Um, great, great conversations come out of that, and people start moving towards one another when that happens. Do That's it. That's really good. Yeah, I, do it. And that I really appreciate it. And I appreciate your time and that you spent with this book, the time you spent having this interview. It's been really helpful for me. I'm praying that it's helpful for our audience and those who are listening and that it can encourage, you know, a cause and effect kind of chain reaction that other people talking about it and they're wondering about it. And they take the next steps. How can people follow you in your work and how can they get a hold of the book? When does it come out? How can they get a hold of it? Yeah, that's a great question, Josh. So it comes out June 25. Um, and, and so I don't know when this is going to post, but it's within a couple of weeks here. And I am about to put up a website called Untangling CRT untanglingcrt.com literally in the process of getting that put together so if people want to contact me they can through there um they can get the book through there of course they can get it on amazon and i'm on twitter 
It's interesting, man, because I very much have tried to avoid being in the social media world. Also, I just I just don't want to do it. Um, but I'm probably even going to need to do more of it. At least <laughs> I for understand. A while. Yeah, so I'm on Twitter at Uzinski32. That's just my last name, which is kind of a mess, but it's Uzinski32. You can find me there. And yeah, if I can be of service in some kind of way in your fellowship or your congregation or parachurch, absolutely reach out. I'd love to help facilitate conversation and change. You know, where where people are wanting to have these kinds of conversations. That's where I want to spend time as God gives me opportunity. So thanks for having me. Thanks for having me on. (laughs) Absolutely. And thanks for being on. And guys, you can go pick up the book, Untangling Critical Race Theory. We want you to do that. We'll put links to this in the show notes. This has been Ed Yuzinski. And thanks again, Ed, for joining us and for our listeners and watchers, viewers. Uh, Till next time, keep your conversations not right or left, but up. God bless you guys, and we'll see you next time.